Voice Radio. Believe it. Slave Dwelling Project. The Slave Dwelling Project is uh, kind of on the front end of what you've already accomplished. Uh, you've done the research, you've uh, written the book, uh, and the, the Slave Dwelling Project is is, uh, is on the front end of all that. And the Slave Dwelling Project came about about three years ago, as, as you stated in the introduction, because of uh, a void uh, in the architectural preservation that we as Americans uh, preserve. Uh, we tend to preserve those uh, iconic buildings, those architecturally significant buildings, with very little attention paid to the place the slaves uh, lived uh, and inhabited. Uh, so with that, I, I took on the, uh, the Slave Dwelling Project to try to fill that void, to let the public know that these places, similar to what you see here on the screen, is just as important because uh, if it were not for the people who lived in these places, then those nicer architecturally significant buildings would not be possible. In fact, uh, it's a strong possibility. I don't know the history or the background of, of this building, uh, but if, uh, if it's uh, any bricks involved in the building of this building or the church that it supports, chances are those were bricks made by slave labor. Uh, something that's uh, very seldom talked about as uh, one would tour uh, uh, this, uh, this city. But in the founding of Charleston, as was alluded to, uh, the 1670, the uh, Barbados connection that came over here uh, and, and, and landed here at, at Albemarle Point of Charlestown Landing, as it is known today, uh, with uh, with that founding, uh, or with that contingency of people who came here, uh, they brought here that knowledge, that ability to build places like this, places 
that they would live. And quite surprisingly, at the end of the Civil War, uh, when there were, uh, well, at the beginning of the Civil War, when there were four and, and a half million slaves, uh, mostly in southern states, they lived somewhere. But surprisingly, a lot of those places are, are, are no longer. Uh, so it is the quest of the Slave Dwelling Project to make sure that the ones that are left are indeed identified. The ones that I see similar uh, to this as I travel around uh, these United States, mainly southern states, but northern states also. They're there also, and I find them as where they are and I identify them uh, also. But what I've, I've learned is the architecture is as was stated, used what was available in the area at the time. A uh, perfect example is uh, my first stay, my first official stay at, at Magnolia uh, Plantation, uh, the wooden structures that uh, were, were built there. Uh, in a recent stay that I, that I went to in Georgia and learned about the, the history of, of Georgia and uh, the intent to, to, to found a state that would not have within its boundary uh, slavery. But it was the South Carolina planters that said, uh, you Georgians might want to think otherwise. You might want to rethink that one. In fact, we'll send you to slave labor to help the process along. And going to Worms Low Plantation and seeing the remains of the oldest building in the state of South Carolina is evident of what was transferred over to the state of Georgia through the slave labor to build the, uh, act, the uh, architecture that was necessary to sustain it all. But beyond slavery, getting into the Freedmen's Cottage, uh, upon emancipation, a, a lot of the slaves got as far away from the plantations as, as they possibly could. Uh, some, some of the elderly, some of the younger ones, uh, with no place else to go, the only life that they knew stuck around. If one were to go to Middleton Plantation and, and, and view the structure that they have there, it's a freedman's cottage. It was the result of one who stayed at uh, Middleton Plantation and inhabited that structure, built specifically for that person. There are freedman's cottage uh, throughout the, the city of Charleston. One would, if one would, would want to compare the, the agriculture to another location here in the United States, a, a closer and, and similar a location to here in the United States, they're somewhat similar to a lot of the shotgun houses that one would find uh, in Louisiana. So that's the comparison of what I'm looking at here uh, in the, the, the Freedman's Cottage uh, versus the, the shotgun houses places where those people continue to stay in those places that were built specifically to replace what uh, what was there the places that they were living uh, on the plantation and one thing other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of these places a lot of the slave dwellings that uh, uh, were on the plantations after emancipation evolved into those uh, sharecroppers uh, the, places where they live, uh, sharecropper shack as, uh, as they were known by some. So, well, I'll end that right here because I know we have other presenters and I could uh, talk about this subject pretty much all day. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Penny, saving the Channel House has been a, a decades-long effort for the National Trust of Barbados. Can you talk about some of the challenges that you all have had to raising awareness about the importance of the structures? So I can do I won't stand up. Um, yes, I think it's very interesting because all over the, the, the US as well as in Barbados, there has been not that much attention paid to slave dwellings. And this is the great change that's happened in the last 10 years, Heart, very hardeningly. We're now paying attention to the dwellings of slaves as opposed to the large plantation houses. But there are not that many left of the slave houses, the original slave houses in Barbados. And one of the efforts we did when we built a, a heritage village of chattel houses, of different designs of chattel houses, at Tirocot in Barbados, was we, for the first time in Barbados, and this was in the early 1990s, we built a replica of a slave hut, interior as well as exterior. And it was 
a revelation to people in the island who'd never ever been inside a slave hut, had no idea that they, how they lived in a slave hut. And it's still standing. Unfortunately, it is one of Henry's slides. I don't know if he's going to find it now. Um, built of stone with a, a trash roof, a thatch roof. And the interest that has been generated has been extraordinary. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about Barbados is that um, the little chattel houses you see, the wooden ones, are sort of, I don't know, it's rather touchingly, miniature Georgian structures. If you look at the Georgian plantation houses with the symmetrical porch and the two windows and the front door, the little chattel house was designed in the same way, so yeah, copying I, Georgian I architecture. The state, oh, great. There is an original there's state, an original state, state but, yeah. With, unfortunately, uh, not, not the original roof on it. But uh, it is still standing there. It's used as storage by the people who own it right now, unfortunately. But, and you don't have the chattel house in Tirupat, do you, Henry? Oh, dear. OK. That would have been interesting to see. Um, and I think, I really don't think there's much else to say about, uh, I would much rather answer questions because I hadn't been prepared to do this panel until yesterday. So I didn't have anything to say, <laughs> written to say. Yes. I have two questions. Uh, what is a trash roof? Thatch roof. It was made of cane trash, which is the cane leavings, the leaves of the cane, or the palm. Yeah, it, it's already been cut and dried and just tied together and, and constructed in layers on the roof. Or the palm thatch, like your palmetto, we have a palm thatch. The the idea, uh, what furniture they had in there? Oh, absolutely, very little. Um, they usually, everybody stayed in one room. It's one room wide with an earthen floor. Uh, they may have had a, a crocus bag and a, and a pole to divide the sleeping area from the rest of, of the slave hut. But the, the, they slept on the floor, usually slept on the floor in some kind of bedding made of, uh, of grass, sweet grass often. And they slept on the floor. Sometimes they had been a trundle bed of some kind that the, the older people slept on. Well, I've seen that in Petersburg, Virginia. Uh, there was a plantation on a battlefield, and they've got a state quarters, and it consists of two levels, and the kids up on top. And down below, there's uh, some mats on the floor and some shoes in the corner. And that's it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Whereas over we, here... That's more, that's more elaborate than we would have had. We never really had two levels. Very seldom. Well, the kids upstairs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, down here, that uh, seems to be uh, a bed and a table and chairs. So... We would have had a table and chairs as well. In our in reproduction house, we had a table and a chair as well. And in the corner, we had what's called a connery, which was used for storing pickled meat. And we would, yeah, this is a, this is a, a pot, a, a clay pot, used for storing with a lid. And that was probably, and uh, they would have cooked outside. I have one big question. You know, for this, for the West Indies, they have a lot of very nice In the early days, they were largely demolished, but I think people learned to build them more securely. And we had the last significant hurricane to touch Barbados was in 1955. You see, there is a tradition that God is a Barbadian, and so the hurricanes pass us by. And we haven't really had a hurricane since 1955. And in 1955, the wooden chattel houses seemed to sway a little with the wind, but to deflect it and the steep gable roofs seem to play a role in that deflection of the wind. The, le the eaves are very narrow, so there's little for the wind to lift up, as in the uh, San Francisco or California bungalow with the extensive roof overhang for shade and cool. So there's nothing much for the wind to lift up. And because the windows and the doors and the little gable windows for ventilation at night in the high end of the gable, these jalousies allow air to pass through. And what destroys a building in a hurricane is really the dramatic drop in barometric pressure. And that causes the house to, impl to implode. And so that doesn't happen in a house which has ventilation with jealousy windows. It allows the pressure to equalize. And so because of the wooden house built with the, with the ventilation, 
And because there's a little bit of mobility, rather like wooden houses and earthquakes, our chattel houses in 1955 survived very much better than modern concrete houses, more, many of which were lost. Also, too, uh, some of the early slave houses were made of coral stone. Remember, they made of stone. And stone walls, of course, resisted the hurricane much stronger. Uh, the, the chattel houses were not made of stone, they were made of wood. But the earlier stone houses were made out of coral stone, which, of course, is Barbados' is coral island. And it's an incredible building material because the more you expose coral stone to the air, the harder it gets. So it becomes impervious. It's really extraordinary building material. Actually, I'm going to just stay over here. My next question is for Dr. Payne. It touches on what uh, Penny was just talking about with the coral, but the whole question of sustainability and the fact that these were all locally sourced materials that uh, the, these builders were using. Right, um, that's certainly something we're losing in architecture uh, these days, into the 20th century now, into the 21st century, this kind of uh, standardization in building where uh, you can't tell the difference between a house that's in Miami or in Phoenix or in Minneapolis or places like that. Um, these are great examples of really preserving a building tradition. Um, we've got <clears throat> great examples here in Charleston, like the single house, uh, which is a great adaptation to the climate in Charleston, also using uh, local building materials. Um, so you're never going to see a single house in you know, Ottawa or someplace like that. Um, so again, I think uh, these chattel houses are, are a great reminder that we need to uh, think more locally, think more sustainably, and continue our building traditions uh, to, to allow these places to remain unique and distinct. I can come back if I oh, sure. like about how the chapel house is adapted a little bit further okay. for lifestyle and for convenience. And to illustrate the point, if we can move on those slides, please. Because this this slide shows the chapel house that was so easily moved because its foundation was completely movable. These are coral stone blocks on which the house sits. So when you have taken apart the, this is a two unit house. So the front unit has three sides to it and two parts to the roof and the floor, six pieces. The back unit, the same. So there are 12 pieces like a stack of cards which will be stacked on your ox cart. And now that most of the owners of wooden houses now own their land, there's very little movement of houses again. But they were stacked on loose stones and at the end of the job, another cart would come along and the stones would be packed on that cart and you move along, wherever the new site is, the stones are laid out and the house is re-erected with very long, usually three or four inch nails. But you see the point with the gable roofs. The gable makes a right angle at the top. It's a 45 degree angle and it deflects the wind. The eaves are an inch or two, a couple of inches. So there's nothing for the wind to pick up. No extensive eave. Now this house has had its jealousy windows and its jealousy door replaced by glass. But the next slide, uh, shows um, jealousy windows at the front and jealousy windows at the side, these half, half uh, windows that, that open and a jealousy front door. So there is ventilation. So that's why in a hurricane, the pressures equalize very rapidly. Now this house is built with shingled walls and a shingled roof. And <coughs> shingles were uh, very long lasting and these were popular and it would have been a question of combination of aesthetics and and uh, cost, but they decided to use planks or whether they decided to use shingles. Shingles went out of fashion because they were more labor uh, requiring compared to the timber house, which went to concrete the next one. And this is accommodating now to a more uh, comfortable lifestyle where the little chattel house has a veranda added. So you've got a comfortable middle class living with a shady veranda where you can sit there and enjoy your rum or your beer when the evening comes and the day's work is done. And this is the cover photo called Stormy Sky for our book cover and exhibition photo by Bob Kiss. So, one, Penny? Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the other slide, the one before. The, the one before? And we talked about the shed roof and the kitchen at the back. Yes. What they call the shed roof. This line, yes. Yeah. Uh, you'll see this has two units with a hip roof. Most, most of them have a gable roof. The earlier houses tended to have the hip roof. Again, that was a Georgian feature. 
And at the back section, you can see that there's a section with a single sloping roof and a door at the side. That would have been the kitchen area, and that was known as a shed roof, because it was built like a simple shed with a simple sloping roof. Uh, cooking in the old days would have been out of doors, but today, many of the wooden houses have been retained, verandas have been put around them, and a stone section of the uh, added at the back to the bathroom and the kitchen next slide, and, and the next one. And now this shows a much more sophisticated house in which there are two units, and you see that the second unit, the middle section, is very much broader than the front unit. This allows a corridor to pierce the middle section so that you now have a room on either side and you don't have to pass through any room to get to the back of the house. You've got two bedrooms behind the front room. Now because the windows are large and spacious, these houses are actually much larger than they look. And the living room at the front of that house is as large as any modern three-bedroom middle-class concrete bungalow that you would find in California. Uh, the window hoods are important. We call these curved hoods bell pelements. You see the filigree uh, decorative fret fretwork on the front porch. Again, it's a palladium porch influenced by Georgian architecture. And then you see, as I said, the stone section at the back for the back door where the kitchen is. Now, I'm not going to give you any more about these houses because I want you to come and see the exhibition. And you'll have the full lecture with all 64 slides tomorrow night, Tuesday night, at the Founders Hall at Charlestown Landing. So that's going to be much more fun. Dr. Fred, can I ask a question? Yeah. Can you go back three or four slides? Three or four slides. Say when? Uh, four, sorry, forward one. Forward. <coughs> Were they always built back to back like that? Because we've got two gables. Yes, we have a valley back. gutter. And the valley gutter would have had a metal strip, and copper or some other metal strip, okay. and the water would come off at the side. If it was a more sophisticated house, it would have had a nice gutter head and a down pipe. If not, as in this house, you can actually see the sunlight catching the extension of the metal guttering. And that will pour the water off a distance from the house. Did they use um, like water gathering systems? Like a cistern they or something? Very often stopped. did. Most yeah. houses of this type yeah. would most houses of this type would have had a simple oil drum, waist high, at the end of the gutter. And that would catch the water which would be used in the house. So this one is the second section is not coming out from the first section. I think the design is brilliant that it coming out of the second section not only meant that you could have a corridor down the middle, but you meant that you had air into that bedroom coming from the outside. We'll side. illustrate that with the next slide. It shows the window on the side, you see, the next one after this. Next one. Right. You can see that there's a little window at the front. So this how this bedroom now has a side window and it has a front window. Ventilation. Is hot. Ventilation on two sides. It's five now. This time of year is yes. much hotter, I <laughs> So this is very important to have that kind of ventilation. Well, let me just add, the temperature in Barbados is just like Charleston. You use Fahrenheit, we use centigrade. It doesn't ever go above 31 degrees, which I think is about 86 Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. So we have the most perfect temperature in the world. <laughs> in the winter, it gets real cold, 23 degrees centigrade or 74 Fahrenheit. <laughs> Are there any other questions so far? I do want to stick to one of your points, though, and talk about the, the structures and the people who built them. Because as you talk about historic preservation, uh, I think we've just lost the source of the <laughs> So you talk about historic preservation, and I was mentioned earlier about how we were, uh, in the early days of preservation, so concerned with the churches and the mansions and the government buildings. But what does the chattel house and the slave dwelling and the freedman cottage say about the skills of the builders of those structures as well? Sure, okay. Well, we distinguish woodworkers into two, the cabinet maker and the carpenter. And the person who built the house was simply called a carpenter. Uh, that individual was often extremely highly skilled and the more skilled carpenters built their own houses and I know a whole number of chattel houses in Barbados built by carpenters who when I interviewed them were people in their 80s or perhaps their wife told me, well my husband built this for us when we got married and this house was exactly what it was like in 1920 something. In 1920-something, there would have been no running water. 
Many of the villages relied on what were called stand pipes. I'm not quite sure of the origin of the name stand pipe, but it was a public water supply in the center of the village to which people would come with buckets to get water if they did not have running water in their house. And those who could initially just afford to have running water, it often simply came to the back of the house, and that was it. And they caught the water at the back of the house and used it in bathtubs and cooking and so on. So running water only became 99% in Barbados about 20 or 30 years ago. When I went home about 30 years ago, the chief medical officer said that her main goal for her tenure as chief medical officer was to bring the running water in houses from 91 to 92% to 100% if she possibly could. So the running water situation collected from the rooftop is important. And in the large houses actually, people had tanks, which we called fish pond roofs, because the roof was so designed that it could hold a tank in the center of the roof. And the water ran from the inside of the hip roofs on four sides to be collected in the tank, which the runoff could then be controlled by a tap at the bottom of the down gutter. That was an important way of getting water before the pipe water supply came in. But those carpenters were exceedingly skilled. They did a wonderful job, and I today am seeing a resurgence of the interest in the carpentry. What people have lost is the skills in making the jealousies. For example, jealousies are derived from the French word jalousie, J-A-L-O-U-S-I-E, which simply means jealousy. And the movable flaps of your jealousy window were designed so that the jealous person could look through without being seen. Or the paranoid, frightened, scared person could look out through the window or door and see who was knocking at the door, perhaps without being seen or letting the person in. So that was the jealousy. And all of the jealousies in Barbadian houses, all of them 50 years ago, they were all adjustable. So that with a simple flick of your, of your finger, your thumb, your hand, you could open and shut those jealousies and they usually had a hole and a nail on a chain to stick them in the closed position or to open them in the open position for ventilation and looking through them. Now the artistry of making those jealousy windows has actually died. And so many people faced with restoration of an old house, instead of re restoring with the wonderful jealousy windows and doors, they put in a modern solid door and solid window shutters. So they lose the flexibility that they have. The house now needs to be air conditioned. Because if it rains and you have to close the windows, then it's hot as Hades, you know. The other type of woodwork is the cabinet maker. And the cabinet makers in Barbados developed tremendous skill. And they made furniture, the wonderful carving, pineapple carving, lovely, um, lovely cabriole legs, everything, the works, showers and tables that are essentially, in many cases, completely indistinguishable from the finest furniture coming out of Britain. And the mahogany in Barbados was a very dark mahogany because the, the rainfall in Barbados is less, much less than it is in Honduras, the source of much Caribbean mahogany and so southern USA mahogany. And because it's so much darker, it was prized by the cabinet makers of Britain. So we developed this tremendous skill with cabinet makers in Barbados. And again, much of that is lost because the precision that you require for making really good furniture is something that is a little bit too challenging for a lot of younger people. So when I went home to Barbados 30 years ago, I knew a number of cabinet makers who were in their 70s, and they were now working a little And when they died, their workshops closed because they could not get young people willing to exercise the discipline to work to the skill that they were accustomed to working to. And in the great councils of Barbados, there are fabulous collections of that furniture, like many of your stately homes here, all made by our Barbadian craftsmen. And it's something that we are hoping that we can regenerate. And that we hope that the college, the, uh, your college, will help us to restore some of those skills. labor transferred uh, here, uh, and it, it transferred so nicely here that it, they had to require a system of slave tags that was uh, well perfected here in, in the city of Charleston. Uh, those slave tags, one could easily research and, and find out what those professions were, 
Carpenters. You can find the carpenters, you can find the bricklayers, you can find the cabinet makers, you can find the people who bought those slave tags because it was very necessary to, in order to build this antebellum city, uh, that you had that labor, that, that slave labor, that, that slave labor that uh, those slave owners can benefit from, especially on the off season uh, when rice was not being grown or cotton was not being grown or whatever the case those slaves may have been used for. They had extra skills and they had skills that were uh, marketable. Then those slave owners could indeed rent them out during the uh, off season. But the more skilled ones that were, were specifically the craftsmen, uh, the artisans, uh, and they were dedicated to, to doing just that. I've come across research uh, in the building of, of St. Andrew's Church where uh, the, uh, the, the head uh, craftsman, the bricklayer, was uh, protesting because he didn't get paid. And, and, and the fact that uh, it, it stated that he had slaves laying the, lay, laying the bricks to, to build that church. Our famous Mr. Robert Mills own two slaves. I, I can't. I can't say that uh, they were specifically involved in his architectural feats that he he did. I, I haven't uh, done that thorough research for uh, yet. But uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, those skills uh, that were, were were brought over here uh, by uh, by these folks who were the iron workers, uh, the carpenters, the cabinet makers, the, the bricklayers, uh, were used here uh, to build this city. Uh, and they, uh, they, were, they were used quite handsomely. And again, if one wanted to uh, get the details of such, uh, one could easily you know, research those slave tags that were issued. Exactly right. I mean, uh, the Panama, when the, the Panama Canal was being built, many Barbadians went and worked on the Panama Canal for a long time and sent money home. And it was the money that was sent back to Barbados that enabled people to then start decorating their houses with what we call barge boards, intricately decorated eave boards that were, and also decorate their window hoods, make the curved window hoods. So it was. It became a, a really a wonderful art form to decorate your townhouse, and it became, as people got more pres prosperous, they were able to do it more and more. Um, so you visited Terracotta, so you saw all the different kinds of chattel houses that we did there. I did, and that actually my follow-up question was, how did y'all choose the homes for Terracotta? Because it seems like it was sort of an evolution. Yeah, we just, um, the architect was Bruce Jardine, he was wonderful, and he's fascinated by the chattel house. And we just did examples of each kind of chattel house. You know, from the, the 1936 one, the very primitive one with the, the two, the two uh, eaves and the two rooms and then the step down into the kitchen to the very elaborate one with the porch all around. And in fact, there's one house that we copied exactly and they were so thrilled with it that they restored their little chattel house. The family from England came back, it was falling apart. So you just have an example of about five different styles of chattel house in one place. It's worth a visit, plus the, the, the uh, stone slave hut, which is a tail cut. Uh, the one thing I wanted to say about um, chattel houses were often cited by people who were knowledgeable about citing a chattel house. It was a great sort of skill in how you cited your chattel house. So you've got the winds coming through. Something that we've totally lost in Barbie is I see these modern structures going up with absolutely no reference to the prevailing winds. So they're hot little boxes. Chatham houses were never hot. They were always sighted so that the wind would blow through and cool the houses. Um, the other thing that we've lost, of course, is the moving of the chattel house because now they're permanent structures. I, some years ago, I co-produced a documentary called with Glastonier, or Dr. Glastonier would call it Chattel House. And it's the story of the chattel house and the filming, and we went into chattel houses and filmed the beautiful little living rooms that they have now. But what we could not find was 
a moving of a channel house. And just by chance one day, I the story, I was just driving down the road and I suddenly saw in the distance some people starting to work on a chattel house. So I screamed in, asked if we could possibly film it. They were a little doubtful. Raced off and got my film crew, which was two miles away. Raced back and we actually filmed the breaking down of a chattel house, putting it on, not an ox car these days, it was back of a truck, and taken off to the next location. Then they started, we went off to that location, sort of building the new chattel house. I don't think that's ever been filmed before and will probably never be filmed again. We have rules in Barbados about the movement of chattel houses. They must only be moved very early on a Sunday morning when there's very little traffic. They can't be moved during the during the weekday, for example, and during working hours. And that all came about because a, a very elderly friend of mine, her husband, drove a sports car and a chattel house was being moved one night, about 10 o'clock at night. And he was in his sports car and the truck moving the chattel house was not well lit and the barge board that Penny referred to is the board along the side of the gable end. Two boards like that which are often decorated and they're pointed and the barge board was sticking out ahead of the truck. The lighting was poor and this man's sports car came around the corner and they crashed and the barge board went right through his chest and killed him instantly. So that led to a change in the laws about when chattel houses could be moved. Yes. Solid, solid. Yes. So solid foundation. That's right. So the, the foundations are mostly solid now, but not all. I would say there's still 10% built on loose coral stone, about 10%. And one, one of the points we have to distinguish is that many people think that a chattel house is a wooden house. It's obviously not. A chattel house was built to be moved, and therefore even if it is built now not to be moved, it conforms to certain architectural characteristics. So people build houses of wood with a completely different shape, have a different footprint, have flat roofs and so on. They're obviously not chattel houses because they do not resemble the movable houses. Yes, ma'am. Um, looking at the, the kitchens, which have turned up in a couple of these slides, yes. I don't see that, why a shed roof on the kitchen and I don't see any chimneys. No chimneys, because, because in the era when larger houses had chimneys, most of the chattel houses cooked out of doors at the back. Well, yeah, but they're, they're not cooking out of doors. No, no, that, that would be a modern kitchen with a modern stove, no chimneys. Okay. Chimneys, chimneys haven't been built in Barbados since about the 1920s. And why a shed roof? Just, just, the cheapest, just the cheapest way of putting on an extension, because, you know, it was and much less was material. And the floor was always earthen. The, the chapel house would have had it with the floor, but you stepped down into the kitchen onto an earth floor. And there was often a little... So it was a lower level. And there was a flap at the back that opened up to let the heat... When they started cooking inside, you could let the heat out the back, in the back wall. And before they, before they had modern stoves, of course. The, the Chatham House, uh, the, the Chatham House we recreated at Terracotta has exactly that. You can come, so you must come and visit Barbados and see Terracotta. Yes, sir. In the early settlement, how much of the coral stone came to the uh, colonies here and what was it used in the Well, our coral stone is entirely mined there. Barbados is a coral island and it was produced by the movement of tectonic plates where the eastern plate moved up underneath the western plate. As a result, as the movement of land and coral came out of the water, it came at different rates and it resulted in the formation of a number of escarpments or coral limestone cliffs and so it's the these billions of coral polyps which produce the coral limestone and these wonderful cliffs extend right across the island i live on the edge of the fourth limestone coral cliff 220 feet above sea level but these cliffs continue across the island and they make for wonderful quarrying and the quarrying of the limestone, therefore, began from very early days when they destroyed all the trees to plant sugarcane. There were no more trees, they couldn't get the wood, although they imported hardwoods from Guyana, which was further down south. They then realized, we've got this wonderful material, coral stone. 
So they, they used stone masons to build coral stone walls. Initially the coral stone walls were built of what they called rubble stone, where they just hacked out the stone and it was any old shape, very irregular. And then great hurricanes occurred in 1780 and 1831. And they had to rebuild an enormous number of buildings. And so an engineer whose wonderful name was Adam Straw Waterman, he was born into slavery, but he was free and he was a brilliant man. And he became the most important builder in Barbados, and he is credited with designing the two-handed saw, which allowed two men to go into the cliffs and to cut coral limestone blocks. Now, in Barbados, we are very conservative. I believe the same has been said about Charlestonians. So the coral limestone blocks were always two feet long and one foot square at the end. Now, you can imagine that it takes a big, strong man like, like um, Joe Hare and David to one at each end to lift a coral limestone block. It would probably weigh nearly 100 pounds. And therefore, building with coral limestone blocks was wonderful to produce really strong buildings, but it was hard work. And so, it was quick though, because it was much quicker to put one block on another than to build a masonry wall with lots of lime mortar. So this man, Adam Straw Waterman, is credited for promoting the rapid rebuilding most of the churches and the big buildings after the Great Hurricane. He's buried in St. George's Church, if you want to go and see his tomb. And there's a, a very sad story related to this man, because one of his sons went to live in Britain and carried the name Adam Straw Waterman. And the great-grandson of that man and his two sons came to Barbados ten years ago to put a nice monument explaining the importance of this engineer in Barbados on his tomb in the parish church where he was buried. And when the three men landed at our airport, someone asked them to remain on the plane where they were told that the mother and wife had been killed on her drive home from Gatwick Airport. And they had arrived with this lovely plaque to be wrecked on the grave. <laughs> And they had to re they returned to Britain on the same flight and came back a year later to the date and they put the, the black on. But it was a tragic story about a great Barbadian whom very pe few people actually know anything about. But it's it's the story of the coral stone I wanted to say. The stone was there. We live on it. We live on top of it, you see. And people were importing timber, pine, from Pennsylvania in particular. They were importing pine to build houses and there was all of this coral stone. So even today, the coral stone is there, but it's hard work to build with it. So what the wealthy people do, because they love the look of coral stone, is that they build houses of normal reinforced concrete, and then the coral stone quarry creates a thin two inch uh, block, which is very thin and therefore very light. So they then face the building with these beautiful coral stone blocks, and they deceive everyone into thinking that it's built with 200-year-old technique. Rhoda. Uh, it is documented uh, the architectural features on the large plantation houses and the grand structures. Has there been any documentation of comparisons between the Barbados slave houses well, I, I think that the exhibition at the City Gallery is the best documentation because for those who haven't seen the brochures and so on, the Barbados Chapel House is illustrated in these fabulous photos on the ground floor of the City Gallery and two photographers who are from South Carolina have documented the wooden folk architecture on the floor above and the contrast is striking in that our houses have this symmetrical design, while the South Carolina houses only occasionally have a symmetrical design. And out at Drayton Hall, where I went this morning, it's very interesting to see houses very much like the ones illustrated upstairs at the City Gallery. Timber houses with wonderful brick chimneys for all of the simplicity of the slave houses at, not Drayton Hall, sorry, Magnolia, for all of the simplicity of the slave houses at Magnolia. They have the most wonderful brick fireplaces. 
So at least, even if they were having to sleep on, on, on straw, they were warm, perhaps, in the winter. I, I want to take the privilege to ask a question. Uh, at what point in the history of these houses would the wood that built them have been imported? Most of the chapel house wood was imported. Um, uh, the trade with North America had become very strong. Pine was coming in from North America, and there was this immediate need to build wooden houses. As any in play, the slave huts, of which we showed one in the first early slide, the slave huts were built of rubble stone and lime mortar. When emancipation came and the houses had to be mobile, they had to import large quantities of wood. It wasn't that they were the very first wooden houses. We have evidence of wooden uh, slave huts being built occasionally. But the large number, the expansion, the villages, the tenantries, it was no longer stone huts for permanence. And that kind was imported from North America because we had cut down all our trees. The only tree that we grew for timber for many, many years has been the mahogany tree. And the mahogany was so praised that if you planted mahogany trees on an acre of land that was not growing sugar, then you didn't have to pay taxes on it. Your question. <laughs> We are almost out of time. Wow, with a lot of questions to go. <laughs> so one, two, and three, and then we're going to stop with the questions. Or uh, as Joe said earlier, we could talk about this all night. Your question, sir? Yes. Uh, when you're moving these, do you disassemble the house, or do you put it on a flatbed and move it? Well, the last one I saw moved was on a truck, which was a flatbed truck. Okay, so oh, the service is absolutely no, no. no it's down. taken out. As I said, it's taken apart. Yes. yes, and stacked like a pack of cards. So yes, so you probably have the floor at the bottom, and then the sides, which would be a little narrower, they go on top of the floor, and then the, the two or the four parts of the roof, which would be the smaller sections, they would go on the very top, and then another vehicle would carry the stones if it was two stones. If, if you go to the gallery, you'll see the red river, one house there. And we move that the same way. Right. We, we did that this week, actually. <laughs> the, the students at the American College of the Building Arts actually built a replica of Chattel House, which is on the main floor at the City Gallery, and we did the same thing on Wednesday. We took it apart, stacked it up, moved it on the back of Mr. Green's truck, and loaded it in. There's just one together. comment I'd make on that. That house illustrates the principle of skills, because there was no one making the movable jealousies, you see. So the windows of the doors do not have the movable jealousies. Traditional chapter house for that. Your question, sir? This has nothing to do with architecture, but what's the difference between Barbadian and Bayesian? Bayesian is the, the, the abbreviation, if you like, and slang. It's slang. It'd be like yes. slang? Or Barbadian simply becomes, when you say it quickly, Barbadian and then Bayesian. And so it's got nothing to do with Baya in California. <laughs> okay. We often hear tourists say, describing it as Baya. But it's Bayesian, it and it's just a contraction of the word Barbadian. So it's slang for Barbadian? Yeah. Slang, if you like, for Barbadian. Bayesian. Ian? Um, it's, uh, it's fascinating to me that you Because the close connection between Barbados and Charleston going back uh, to the 17th century and then to the American War of Independence tended to peter out after that. And the, your famous South Carolina historian George Rogers described Barbados as the post office for the Carolinas until the War of, in, the War of Independence. And things changed, trade changed, and so on. And there was very much less contact in the 19th century. So by 1838, when slavery ended in Barbados, the connections with Carolina were not nearly as strong. But Penny has a thought on that. Yeah, just a thought on that too. Remember that where Barbados is situated is the most easterly island of the Caribbean. Anyone coming from England, Africa, 
had to go through Barbados because of the prevailing trade winds. This is the age of sail. The minute you needed, you had power in your boats, you didn't have to come through Barbados, so the trade was not so immediate and so direct. That really was a huge shift in the trading patterns. But for, for centuries, you had to come stop at Barbados. That was the first stop on the way through the Caribbean and back up to America. You just went with the winds. It came down across the Caribbean and up again to the United States. And there is a science for that. Din, din, okay, experts, D-E-N, wood, the study of wood and the aging of wood. Come on, you experts, help me out. Thank you. Dendro Dendrology. Uh, yeah, there is, there, there is a science for that that could probably, uh, that sounds like a research um, uh, project that somebody should take on because you could actually, if it's identify the wood because what, what I'm doing with my project that I do is I can identify brick. I can do it. Uh, uh, well, I can't do it. I know experts that, that can that can find out where in the earth the clay came from to make those fireplaces or those uh, uh, bricks that compose some of those slave dwellings. So there is a, a way of finding that out. But I think the important thing is that pine was used, and South South Carolina probably was not a great producer of pine. Was it? It was. Yes. Yeah. That's interesting. That is a project. That is a research project you should pursue. So, more research. All right. So, my last question for the panel is final thoughts, and we'll try to wrap this up in the next five minutes. But I'm going to ask the question, and then you can pass the mic down. What's next in terms of the preservation of the chattel house? What's next for the slave, slave dwelling project? What's next in historic preservation for Barbados? And what's next in historic preservation? What's the next step for historic preservation in the United States? Okay, with regard to the Chattel House, their apparent future was terribly negative, but it has been stemmed. And the work of our National Trust, I think, has helped. And the work of Bob Kiss, I think, has helped. The important resolution for the Chattel House is twofold. Older people, and Barbados has the highest national figures for centenarians in the world. Older people want to live in a modest cottage, and people keep downsizing. Well, the Chattel House is actually perfect. So most of our older residents who are still in a strong Chattel House, they stay there and they like it. So there's a sustainability for older couples. The other thing is adaptive reuse. And chattel houses are being adapted and reused as real estate offices, as shops, as barber salons, as, as fashion salons, as hair salons. All over Barbados, especially on the west coast and the south coast, the chattel houses are actually undergoing restoration, beautification, and adaptive reuse. And people are building modern houses that are slightly larger, exact replicas of chattel houses, including well-to-do construction magnates, are living, are living in lar slightly larger versions of the chattel house with verandas all around. So I think the future of the chattel house is an interesting icon being preserved and appreciated, while 25 years ago, it was regarded as something, let's forget it. Uh, Future of the Slave Dwelling Project immediately, uh, 501c3 status. Uh, and I'm putting together the 2014 schedule of places that I'll be staying. If any of you want to join me in the state, you're more than welcome to do that. And uh, uh, please mark this down, take, take, take note of this. Uh, September 18th through the 20th, Thursday through Saturday of 2014, next year, 2014, the first Slave Dwelling Project conference will be in Savannah, Georgia. I'd like to take a little credit for the Chattel House film too, because you know video has an impact. And every year in Independence, they show that Chattel House documentary. And I think people took pride, and certainly the owners of the houses are very proud of the houses that are in the film. And that pride has spilled over now into the idea that they might want to preserve this house rather than move up to the the more socially um, wealthy concrete houses. I think that's important. And of course, for Barbados, there's so much restoration that needs to be done, not just in the chattel houses, 
Um, Henry is chairman of a, of a committee that is now beginning a big push to, to restore the 10 or the seven most significant houses or buildings that need to be restored in Barbados. And also we have in Barbados one of the last of the working windmills that used to grind sugar. The last working windmills in Barbados, which we restored. And that, of course, it's lasted because it was built at Coral Stone. Um, so we have a lot of work ahead of us and a lot of money to raise to restore these buildings, but it is an ongoing and a huge project that we would like to start. Don't get Henry started on which buildings they are, because he could go on for the rest of the night. <laughs> As far as preservation here in the United States, um, I, I think this, the examples of the Channel House uh, show us that it's the whole spectrum of architecture that's important to preserve. Again, this is a, a point that's been made already, but it's not just the mansions and the big churches and the government buildings, but it's that whole spectrum of architecture that we need to be concerned about. And I think there's still lots of work to be done here in the United States to uh, really highlight some of the buildings on the other end of the spectrum, the single houses, the Freedmen's Cottages, things like that. So, still a lot of work to be done here in the United States. But I must say that, that the, 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 the legislation you have for restoring historic buildings, giving people tax incentives and tax write-offs, is something we've struggled for years to get our government to do in Barbados, and it has not yet done it. Um, and it's very, very important in the restoration of, of your houses in, in the United States. May I ask a question? How many people have visited the wonderful slave huts preserved at Magnolia Garden? Again, only a handful. Half of the room. Half, this half of the room hasn't been out there. It really, it really is fantastic. You really should go and see them uh, after you've gone to the City Gallery exhibition. Yes. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank Dr. Fraser and Joe McGill. David Payne and Penny Heinem for their time this evening. Just a reminder, as Dr. Fraser's already said, tomorrow evening at 6.30 at Founders Hall, Charlestown Landing, uh, Dr. Fraser will be giving a lecture on aspects of Barbados architectural history with comparisons to South Carolina. Uh, thank you all for joining us for the first Mary Scott guest lecture of this season for the American College of Building Arts. Our next lecture will be October 9th back at the college, provided the air conditioning is working. <laughs> it will be on Art Deco Architecture in Charleston. You can find a full schedule of all of the Mary Scott guest lectures on the back table. Thank you all for coming. Let me
Believe.